Good evening. It's good to see everybody out tonight. We'll start off with prayer request. I feel like I'm echoing a little bit. Prayer request tonight. The bomb. The bomb family. It's really good that we've got both Nada Bullock and Myra Mooney in class tonight. you created the universe that we get to see and exist in, Heavenly Father. And Lord, we are both in awe and fear of you, Heavenly Father, with the power that your voice yields. And Lord, we come to you before your throne, humbling servants, Heavenly Father. And we know, Lord, that you hear our prayers and we thank you for that. We pray that you'll forgive us of our sins and our trespasses and pray that we will live in a way that is pleasing to you. Lord, we've had many names called tonight, Heavenly Father, and we pray that you'll be with each one of them as you uh, know what's best in those situations. We're also thankful, Lord, for those who are in attendance with us tonight, Lord, they've been on our prayer list, and we're always thankful of the prayers that you answer, Heavenly Father. We know that we do not thank you near enough for the prayers that are answered every day for us on our behalf. Lord, we pray that you'll be with us as we uh, continue to study out of Genesis tonight. We pray that you will help us to learn from your word and that all of us will be attentive to that, Heavenly Father. Lord, pray all these things in your great and holy Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. It is a pleasure to be with you tonight. Uh, I always like to take that quarter off, uh, January, February, March, because that's when Last Leaders is going, and I got some. I always have a lot of work stuff that time of year, too, so it's nice for me to take that quarter off. But I will tell you this, I was, I was thinking about... Stephen Hodgins, Devo and I, and, and, and if you have never taught a class, I, I urge you to do that, because I can tell you this much, uh, my effort when I don't teach goes down significantly. My behavior goes down significantly. So I've had people try to, you know, try to tell me, you only need to, you only need to teach every other quarter, and I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> Let me teach as much as you possibly can because I'm a much better Christian when I'm doing that. It's, it's a work that I enjoy. So I appreciate the, the opportunity the elders uh, have given me with this class. And I went back and forth on whether or not we were going to hit Genesis or whether or not we were going to hit something else because I was looking at the calendar and we've got like four or five weeks before Winning Wednesday start. And then Winning Wednesday start and I'm like, well, there is no way I can finish 16 chapters. I think that's what we have left, 14 chapters of Genesis in five weeks. But then again, I was like, but I'm pretty sure I can get pretty deep in to some pretty cool what I call Bible stories. And so this is one, this is what I call the VBS version of, of, of Genesis. You know what I mean? Like you're getting to that good stuff. When you get Jacob and Esau, Esau moves on and you just focus on Jacob who becomes Israel and the 12 tribes. And so this is where the some of the meat of the end of Genesis gets going. So I think... I decided we're going to stay in Genesis. So I hope you're happy with that. Um, I toyed about going and doing a short New Testament book, but I decided to stay in Genesis. And so as a quick review, uh, we were ending, Isaac had, Isaac had passed away, and so we were in Jacob and Esau's life is where we ended back in December. So as you recall, what kind of reunion was happening at the end, you know, in chapters 30 through 35, you know, what was the big concern for Jacob as he was coming home. Esau will still be angry. And why would Esau be angry with Jacob? He stole his birth. Now, wait a minute. He, did he steal it? I mean, Esau thinks he stole it. But Esau sold it for some red soup. And I don't know if that was curry or tomato. Either one, I'm not selling anything for. That's just me. Don't like tomato soup, don't like anything red, it's just not my thing. So, 
He is afraid that Esau is going to kill him or attack him. And so he has these concerns. And what does he do is he brings this massive entourage back with him from getting his wife. What does he do to his, to his, his wives, his children, the flocks, etc., as he goes to meet Esau? He takes, he takes his favorites and puts them back there, right? But who do he put out front? The less favorable ones. That's the best way to say that. There's no other way to say that, right? So he, he sends out his servants and their children first. Actually, he sent out a servant first. Then he sends out the servant and their children. Then another servant and their children, right? And so he goes, and, and who is the last wife and child that, that goes ahead? Rachel and who? Yeah, Rachel and Joseph. Um... Do you think that's going to be a significant theme through the rest of Genesis? Yeah, and that's why I set that up the way I did. Now, what was Esau's response when he gets this enormous gift? Right, because it's all a gift. All of it's this is for you. This is we're giving this to you. This is you, Esau. Your servant, you know, is behind you. What was Esau's response? He said, "I didn't need it." He said, "I don't need this. I got enough." And that's a very important part of the story that we don't need to overlook. That Esau, even though he was not, quote unquote, the chosen son of the two, he had still done well for himself. And God had still blessed him. And so that is where we basically ended. Isaac died in, the, in chapter 35. His two sons bury him. That's almost a reunion very similar to two other sons that had had some estrangement in their life and then came together and buried their father. Who does that sound like? Isaac and Ishmael, when they buried who? Not a trick question. Abraham. I was told at work last week that I am intimidating when I ask questions that are very easy. And that blew my mind because I thought I was being right the opposite. I thought I was being super simple. I'm like, oh no, because I know you're trying to trick me. And I'm like, I would never do that. So yes, Isaac and I, you know, we know these questions. So that's the point of a review, is to get these simple things back in our brain. So if I intimidate you with very simple questions, I don't mean it that way at all. It hurt my feelings dearly when I was told that. But anyways, moving right along, Isaac's passed away. Chapter 36 is a rather lengthy chapter with a whole lot of names that I cannot pronounce. And we're going to skip, for the first time in Genesis, we're going to skip most of chapter 36, but I have my reasons, okay? We're going to start out with chapter 36, we're going to go with first one, we're going to go through about nine verses, and then I'm going to summarize the end of the chapter, primarily because you don't want me to read most of it, just trust me. You're going to do that for homework tonight, you can read the names, all right? But I'm going to make some key points about it. So we're here in verse one, verse chapter 36. These are the generations of Esau, that is Edom. Quick question. Why are we hearing about Esau first? He's the firstborn, but what else is significant about it? This happened another time in Genesis. Another son was mentioned first, and his descendants were mentioned first, but he wasn't the chosen son. Which son am I talking about? Once again, not a trick question. There's only a big... Ishmael. We got Ishmael's genealogies first. Before we get Isaac. Did we get any real detail about Ishmael, though? No. All it was was a history. These are the genealogies. He was a wild donkey of a man. His hand was against everybody. Then you get a whole bunch of names about Ishmael. And then, chapter ends, and you go on to Isaac, and you get chapters about Isaac and his family. The same thing is happening here with Esau. Esau, basically, this is what we call, we have to give this information but we're going to make it very, very small. In a sales call, if I'm at a customer, this is what I call the boring stuff, the fine print. Get this out of the way really quick, and I'll talk about what we're really trying to sell today. Right? That's how that works. This is a very similar situation the way this writer is doing this. Now, who was Genesis originally written to? What group of people? And once again, not a trick question. Who was originally intended to read the book of Genesis? Jews or Israelites. So are they, are they extremely concerned about Esau? No. Okay, so keep that in mind too. 
So here we go. These are the generations of Esau that is Edom. Esau took his wives from the Canaanites. That's important because he didn't stay there. But he got wives from there. Just put that as a footnote. Adah, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. Oh, Halabama. I tried that seven times and it sounded terrible when I said it just then too. The daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion the Hivite. And Basemath, Ishmael's daughter. It's unique right there. The sister of Nebeth. And Adah bore to Esau Eliphaz. Basath bore Rule. And there's her name again. Oh, Halabama. Don't have a clue. For Jeush, Jalem, and Korah, these are the sons of Esau who were born to him in the land of Canaan. Put a footnote right there. Esau was living where? But who's supposed to live in Canaan? The Hebrew. The Hebrew. The Hebrew. The who's coming back? Right at the end of chapter 35. Who's come back? That would be Jacob. Do you think these two well-off individuals are going to coexist very well? Does this sound like another family unit? Let's think of Abraham and Lot. Did they stay together the whole time? Because they were too big. Notice that theme continues. And so we want to talk about when God decides to bless a people, He does it big. It's very noticeable. And He had promised... He had made a promise that this is going to be taken care of. These people are going to get Canaan. He had made a promise that this is going to Isaac. But that doesn't mean that he completely ignored or forsook Esau. So make sure we keep this in mind when we go through this. Verse 6, it says, Then Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all the members of his household, his livestock, all his beasts, and all his property that he had acquired in the land of Canaan. He went into a land away from his brother Jacob. So he left. It doesn't say that there was a discussion. It doesn't say that Jacob said to leave. From all intents and purposes, from what we read here, it sounds like this was Esau's decision. But then we get a nice little footnote here. And that is, for their possessions were too great for them to dwell together. Was Esau lying when he told Jacob, I don't need your gift? Not at all. In fact, Jacob, or excuse me, Esau may have seen this more as, I don't need the headache. I'm already having enough time pasturing my flock. I don't need yours too, Jacob. So their possessions are so great in the land of Canaan. Do you think they become well known in that land? Now, quick question. Americans love Rich people, true or false? We love the fault of being rich, but we tend to despise wealthy people. Let's be honest with ourselves. Let's just be frank. We all want the American dream, but we're all sick to green envy when we see someone actually get there. And then we want to tax them and take it all away from them. And we talk about them. We call them fat cats. You know we do it. Just go ahead and be honest with yourself. They got it so easy. The big corporations. I work for a big corporation. Every time somebody says that, I'm like, they pay me well. I'm happy with it. I know you hate them. Right? We don't like that. We think about people that guy that invented Facebook worth billions of dollars. We're like, no human being deserves that kind of money. Well, he doesn't deserve it, but he got it. No skin off of my back. Is it odd to you that everyone that still lives in Canaan hates the Jews? Have you ever thought about that? Yes, we talked about the family history between Isaac and Ishmael, and there's some history there you just can't undo, right? Old Father Abraham threw you out in the desert with a bag of water and said, good luck. You're not going to be crazy about that group of people. But there's also another thing I think that goes down here is, if you're a sojourner in that land, these people have come in and they have taken over and they are what we would call filthy rich. But to make that point, I'm going to summarize from this point forward the rest of 36. And the rest of 36 is this. Esau had a lot of kids. A lot of them. 
14 of them became chiefs in the land of Seir, S-E-I-R, and I'm probably saying that wrong. Now, the reason I tell you that he had 14 chiefs is do you know how many chiefs were in Seir when he went there? Four. And Esau had 14. Do you think Esau took over the land of Seir? Yeah. If he had 14 chiefs and the land of Seir had four, did he take over? Yes. This means yes. Not a trick question. Okay? Is it still known as the land of Seir? Do you remember right at the very beginning of chapter 36? This is genealogy, right? And this is supposed to be a very boring class, so I apologize if it's boring. But, just bear with me. Notice it says in verse 1 of Esau, that is what? Edom. What is Edom referring to? Is that a landmass, or did they change Esau's name? It's the Edomites. That's a group of people. This is kind of like what happened in America about 300 years ago. When a group of people that were Irish and British came to a land known as Tishomingo and Itawamba and Mississippi and renamed it the United States of America. Now, we turned out really good from that. Native Americans, not so much. We changed the name. Esau did the same thing. He goes over there. His inhabitants are so great. His possessions are so great. He completely takes over the land of Edom. Did God bless Esau? Yes. God did not forget Esau. The rest of this, though, starts talking about kings. And kings came from Esau. And it actually mentions in here, and people have used this as a proof that Genesis is, is, was, is incorrect, or the Bible's inaccurate, because it talks about this occurred before the kings of Israel. But if you look at the date stamps, and when we think Genesis was written, if it was written by Moses, Moses wrote it before they were kings of Israel. How could Moses have possibly known that? Not a trick question. How could Moses have known that? How could Moses, if we think Moses wrote Genesis, know that there were kings of Edom before there were kings of Israelites? The kings of the Israelites. Inspiration. God breathed. Who wrote Genesis? Was it Moses? Yeah. Was it God? Yep. It's a prophecy, I honestly believe that. I honestly think this is a prophecy right here that we just read right over in chapter 36 because we don't even care. We don't want to pronounce the name. So understand this, there were kings that occurred in that area, there were chiefs, there were 14 chiefs. They are named. You could almost say there were 14 tribes, that there were 14 chiefs that came from Esau. Now, we're moving on. How many tribes are there of Israel? Not a trick question. Twelve. Okay? So 14 came from Esau. Twelve tribes or large groups of people came from Israel. And so, here we go. Chapter 37. Everybody content with 36? Do you feel like I'm jipping you because I didn't read all the names? Please, go home and read them tonight. It's a good read. It's a good read. If you can pronounce them, let me know because I can't. All right, verse 1 of chapter 37. It says, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. And everyone that just read that is like, not another genealogy. That's not what's fixing to happen. Calm down. Okay? Moses cares about the Israelites, so you get the detail. You get what I call, and I hope she's listening to this, you get the Cindy Farr version of the story now. You get all the details. Right? I love you, Mom, if you're listening. All right, because she listens to these, like, during the week, she tells me that. I'm not sure she does, but she tells me she does. So I'll know, because she'll mention this to me. But anyways, Joseph, see, we already got a name, being 17 years of age. So before you think we're getting a genealogy, we're getting the whole story here. So how old is Joseph when this story starts? 17. Do we think of 17-year-olds as being nice, polite, professional individuals? They usually have a lot of fun, right? Keep that in mind. 
because I'm not going to tell you what I call the traditional Bible version story of this, not Bible version, that sounded terrible, Bible school version of this story, which is the pictures, and it's the stalks, and they're bending over, right? And it's this happy story of a prophecy of when it's going to happen one day. I don't want you to think of this from his side of the story, because that's how we always teach it. I want you to be one of the 11 brothers that had to listen to it. Because I think sometimes we miss there's some parenting advice in here, there's some stories in here, and there's some things that we can relate to in our dark, deep areas that we don't like talking about when we t study it from that perspective. So this is your 17-year-old annoying brother. Young baby brother. Now, Ben is younger, Benjamin's younger, but this one is really young and really annoying. And he walks in, and this is what he tells you. Oh, let me back up. Let me back up. He's 17 years old, was pasturing the flock up with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah. Who was Bilhah and Zilpah? So, if he was hanging out with those children... Where did those children end up in that caravan? Do you remember? Were they at the back or the front? They're at the front. So if they got killed, that's okay. Okay? They're not the important children. So you're already growing up with a daddy that put you out front and an uncle that he thought was going to murder you. And then your 17-year-old brother runs and tattletales on you. Listen to it. He says, And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now, we have no idea what that means. That could have meant that they were sinning. It could have meant that they were, they were not working like they should have been. We have no idea. But let's just assume, or let's just take this into a second, that you're the second-rate son of the handmaid. And your 17-year-old brother runs and tells a bad report to you to your father. Is father going to be happy with you or upset with you? He's going to be upset, right? This reminds me of a story that my sister loves to tell of when she finally got the best of me. Because I was that annoying little brother. And I always got my way, according to Michelle. And one day, admittedly, she pushed me. I was sitting on the floor and she pushed me over. And I was being goofy and fell over it. She didn't push me that hard. And I fall over, but I hit a Tonka truck. And that hurt. And if I'm hurt, who's getting in trouble? Michelle. So I lit it up big time. The tears were flowing. I was laying, Michelle pushed me, yada, da, da, da. And I mean, mom comes to the aid and mom is going to take care of Michelle. And my sister, who does not speak at this point in her life, like you wouldn't know her now and where she was back then, but at this point in her life, she didn't speak. In fact, my dad, and if you know the Fars, some of you know what the Fars can do with their eyes, dad could look at Michelle wrong, and she would start crying. Not say a word, just look at her. Which if you've seen a Far mad at you, you know what I'm talking about, right? But if you don't, I'm sorry, you don't get it. But anyways, Michelle is fixing to get in trouble with mom. And Michelle stands up and she says, you are spoiling Jonathan. Mom looked at her. She's like, what do you mean? She said, I barely touched him and he hurt himself and he cries and so you just assume I'm guilty. My life changed forever that day. <laughs> I didn't get away with anything. <laughs> the reason I tell that story is not so you can laugh at the story, but because I want you to empathize. I don't think this was probably the first time Joseph ever told a bad report on his brothers. It's the first one we hear about. So he tells this bad report. It, does, it gets underneath their skin. But there's not a whole lot they can do about it. But it gets worse. If you read verse 3, Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. I don't know if you've ever faced favoritism in your family. I don't know. I don't know if you ever dealt with that. My parents 
growing up, were almost obnoxious about this in the opposite extreme. Like, if, you have, if, if they paid $19.63 for my gas, Michelle got a check for $19.63 for her gas. Because she made, they made it a point that it's going to be down the middle to the penny. Okay? That's okay. I, and I appreciate that. I'm not, not complaining. But this is right the opposite. And I've known people who, for whatever reason, they're fourth or fifth on their parents' list, and it affects them for the rest of their life. It just does. When you're the outcast child, it's not a good feeling. There's a story that I want to tell that I can't. But anyways, because I get in a lot of trouble if I did. But anyways, if gifts are handed out, let's pretend you're at Christmas time. Right? And, and, and Jacob is going, I guess Christmas time at this time would be sacrilege. But anyways, bad example. Because Jesus wasn't on the earth yet. But anyways, let's just say it's whatever holiday they're worshiping with at the time. And that's a gift-giving holiday. And... Papa Jacob comes out, and he goes, here's a $5 bill for you, $5 bill for you, $5 bill for you. And Joseph, you get the coat of many colors. Now, you're a red-blooded Israelite or American. Are you celebrating that? I'm so happy for my brother. I'm so glad he got that coat of many colors. How do you feel? Envious. That's a natural reaction like, we love to sell the brothers down the road, but here's the deal. Parents, if you're in the room, Jacob has responsibility for this too. He is also guilty for what his own children did to his own son. Do not miss that part of this story. I think there's a reason God gave us this part of the story. Because if we just got that he got thrown in a pit, what would we think about those brothers? They're just terrible people. Killed, wanted to kill their own brother, then sold them into slavery. But we get a whole lot of lead-up version into this, right? There's the caravan incident. I'm sure that was talked about. That was kind of a big event when you met Uncle Esau, right? I'm sure that was talked about. Then he goes and tattletales on us. And then he gets the coat of many colors. And I learned in my research of this chapter, and it cracked me up, and I realized why we picked what we picked. Do you know that we're not sure that the Hebrew word here actually means coat of many colors? It could also mean robe with long sleeves. And I can almost see a, a, a guy writing the Bible go one day, long sleeves, many colors, many colors. Okay? I mean, let's think about this. If we were trying to tell our children he got a coat with long sleeves, it just wouldn't have the same ring to it. I'm just telling you that for clarity's purposes, that sometimes translations can get funny that way. But this coat, whether it was long-sleeved or multiple colors of ribbons through it, of different colors, we have no idea. What we do know, though, is, is King David was given a similar robe, and it was had the same word that's used here. So whenever you understand this, don't think of this that he got a suit coat. Because if it was worthy for King David to wear it as an honorable robe, was this a much bigger gift than we often make it out to be? Yeah. This was a royal robe. Now keep that in the context of what you're about to hear. He was given a royal robe, and what does he do next? He has a dream. And now you're the brother, right? You're happy about this. You love the fact that he got this coat of many colors. Verse 4, but when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Why did the brothers, according to the Bible, why did the brothers hate Joseph? Favoritism from the parents. Favoritism from the parents. So when I, I told you all that earlier, parents, that you have a responsibility to your own children not to do this, if you're currently doing it, stop. If you want your children to get along and have a good family unit when they grow up and you're dead and gone, you need to stop that. Just stop. Because this is why they did it. God told us this, but we just, I don't know why there are certain parts of the Bible we just, just ignore like it didn't happen. Like we love the story of Jonah, but we never read the last chapter to our kids where Jonah went out and got upset and cried and wanted to die. 
We just forget that last chapter. Don't forget this part. There's a whole lesson here. And I know I'm belaboring it, and we're only like five verses in, but y'all know me. All right, here we go, five minutes. Now Joseph, verse 5, had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. Now listen to the dream in the context. He got a king's robe. And then this is his dream. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. And put just a little bit of an arrogant, favored, favored child, a little bit of a snatchy attitude on this. This is a 17-year-old. This is not the humbled Jacob that's been sold into slavery, been imprisoned. This is not the same guy. So don't attribute the same character to him here. Because most spoiled, favored children that I have known in my life are not very fun to be around. So there's no reason for me to think Jacob was just the, sun, the ray of sunshine. So when he's writing this, and you may be like, Jonathan, you're totally missing this. That's fine. You can take it however you want to. But when I read this, I don't be this as in, listen to this dream that I had. Can you help me understand it? That's not how it says here in my mind, but that's okay. It says, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves, brothers, gathered around my sheaf and bowed down to my sheaf. What does that mean? The works of your hands bowed down in worship to the works of my hands. You're the brothers. He just got a king's robe. Now he had a king's dream. Do you think he's getting a little big for his britches, maybe? Now, this may very well have been a vision, and we always interpret it that way, and I think it was a vision, because this did come true, right? But keep yourself in the context of the favored parent, the coat of many colors, the king's dream of being worshipped. His brothers didn't miss this. It says in verse 8, His brother said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. This reminds me of where you hear it in the Bible, they got so angry at Jesus, they gnashed their teeth at him. This is what this reminds me of because they're sick of him. And you know, they're looking at Jacob and go, will you say something, Pops? Look what you've created. We're going to go a couple verses deeper because Jacob gets a dose of this too, believe it or not. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars. The sun, the moon, and eleven stars. Who's the sun and the moon? That'd be the parents were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and his brother, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Now we're going to conclude right there because we have to set the stage for what's about to happen. Jacob, I think, has figured this out. He had a few visions in his lifetime. He's figuring out, okay, this is my favorite child, yes, but something's going to happen later in life. He says he kept this in mind. Reminds me of Mary keeping all these things and pondering them in her heart. Jacob doesn't know what this means, but notice he did not praise Jacob for sharing this dream, did he? The Bible says he rebuked him. All that leads up to the story of him getting sold into slavery. And we're going to talk about slavery a little bit and how it worked back then and, and those things. But keep this in mind, before we just crucify the brothers in our own thoughts, have you ever had similar thoughts about people that did much less because they got a little bit more than you thought they deserved or a little bit less than you thought you deserved? 
It's all about scale, right? I mean, yeah, no one here, I don't think, brother or sister got a king's robe or had dreams about being worshipped. So it's a different scale. I'm not saying you want to sell someone into slavery. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying at least try to get yourself in that mindset of you can relate to the feelings that these guys are having. Thank you so much. Hope you have a great week.